A little while ago, I watched a couple of videos produced by Numberphile, a channel which loves to point out the wonderful and often weird world of number theory. Now, normally, I love Numberphile videos. They are informative and interesting. But these two gave me more pause for thought than usual. Here are the natural numbers, i.e. all the whole numbers from 1 upwards to infinity. These numbers get larger and larger as you go along the series, and if you go infinitely far, they become infinite themselves. So what do you get when you add up all these numbers? Infinity, you say. I mean, how could you not? Well, according to number file, when you add these numbers all the way to infinity, you get minus a twelfth. Sounds astounding, doesn't it? Certainly didn't make sense to me, and the more I watched the videos, the less sense it made. I've included links to both videos down below. Please do give them both a visit, and when you do, there are two particular passages that I would like you to look out for, which set alarm bells ringing for me. First up is Associate Professor Antonio Padilla of the University of Nottingham, whose proof involves the use of Grandi's series, an infinite series in which the terms alternate between 1 and minus 1. OK, Bob, run the tape. We need to attach a number. Now, clearly, what is the answer to this? Now, you take, you take, you stop this at any point. OK, if you stop it at an odd point, you're going to get the answer 1. If you stop it at an even point, at, at an even point you'll get the answer 0. Clearly, that's obvious, right? So what number are we going to attach to this infinite sum? Do we stop at an, e inf an odd or an even point? Well, we don't know. So we take the average of the two. So the answer's a half. There are other ways to prove that this sum is a half, by the way, which we can do if you want. But No, no, there'll be a link, there'll be a link there, because we've done it before. OK, so good. So you'll see the link there. OK, so, so this is a half. But I think intuitively that's the easiest way to see it, that you either get 0 or 1, and therefore you just take the average. So this is the natural number to attach to this sum. So, Grandy series. What do we know about that? Well, the first place to look is Wikipedia. This is what the page looked like on the 23rd of November this year. In the first paragraph we see, it is a divergent series, meaning that it lacks a sum in the usual sense. On the other hand, its Cesaro sum is one half. This is the value that Professor Padilla uses in his proof, so that's the link to follow. Here we are. In mathematical analysis, Cesaro summation assigns values to some infinite sums that are not convergent in the usual sense. Below that we see, the term summation can be misleading, as some statements and proofs regarding Cesaro summation can be said to implicate the eilenberg mazur swindle. Oh dear, that doesn't sound good. For example, it is commonly applied to Grandi's series, with the conclusion that the sum of that series is one half a result that can readily be disproven. So, we start to investigate Grandi's series, and already we're reading words like swindle. In the other number file video, Professor Edmund Copeland, also of the University of Nottingham, finds the sum using the zeta Riemann function. One of the stepping stones is the following. Uh, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and just keep adding higher and higher powers of x. And what we know is that this is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. That's a known result. In fact, it's strictly true for x less than unity. So as it stands, this is, this is uh, it's limited, formally limited in its value. We're going, to, we're going to manipulate it a little bit. We're going to push the boundaries at which we, we're going to use it. We can no, no. There are good reasons why we can't do that. Here's where that formula comes from. Take a look at this expression. If you expand out the brackets, you find that most of the terms cancel out, leaving you with 1 minus x to the fourth. The same applies to this expression. Again, most of the terms in the expansion cancel out, leaving, in this case, 1 minus x to the fifth. In general, the power of x that you end up with is 1 more than the largest power in the brackets. Providing x is not 1, we can divide both sides by 1 minus x to give this. It only works if x isn't 1, as otherwise you would end up with 0 divided by 0, which is undefined. It is perfectly permissible to extend the powers of x up as far as you like, and the pattern still holds, even up to x to the power of infinity, and you get the following. Again, for this to be valid, 
x can't be 1. Since 1 more than infinity is the same as infinity, x to the power of infinity appears on both sides of the equation. Providing that x lies between minus 1 and 1, this equation reduces to the one that Professor Copeland uses. In that case, x to the power of infinity reduces to 0. Try it on the calculator. Type in a half and keep multiplying it by itself. You will find that eventually the calculator reads 0. Now try it with a negative fraction like minus a tenth and keep multiplying it by itself. The sign oscillates from positive to negative and back, but again the calculator eventually reads 0. However, that equation does not work if x is minus 1, and that is the value put in by Professor Copeland. Try that on the calculator, and you will find that the answer just oscillates between minus 1 and 1, like a multiplication version of Grandy's theories. Minus 1 to the power of infinity is therefore undefined. Granted, he differentiates the equation first before putting in minus 1, but in that case, he should differentiate the full expression with x to the infinity in it, not the simplified version. And how would you differentiate x to the power of infinity anyway? Now, indulge me a moment while I show you another set of numbers. This is the harmonic series, an infinite series where the terms start with 1, then a half, then a third, and so on, with the denominators increasing by 1 each time. You might think that an infinite number of terms will have to give a finite number, as each term is getting smaller. But Nicole Oresme proved in the 14th century that the infinite sum is actually infinity. Here's how we did it. Here I list the first few terms, and underneath each term I will write in pink the fraction which is the largest power of a half, i.e. half, quarter, eighth, etc., that is less than the term. So underneath a third I write a quarter, as that is the largest power of a half that is less than a third. A resume showed that the fractions in this pink series can be grouped so that it will add up to an infinite number of halves. Look at the yellow boxes. You see that the fractions in each box are either a half or add to give a half. And you can draw an infinite number of these boxes. Since a line of halves, infinitely long, will add to give infinity, and each term in that pink series is less than the corresponding term in the harmonic series, the harmonic series must add to give infinity also. You will see this proof listed in many mathematical textbooks. It's accepted by the mathematical community as being perfectly valid. Now I'm going to apply the same logic to our old friend, the natural numbers. Under each term, I have written the number 1, which is less than each term in the natural numbers except the first. This leaves an infinite line of 1s, which add up, of course, to infinity. If that bothers you, think of each one in that series as a person in a line. An infinite line of people gives an infinite number of people. So, as with a resume's proof, the series in pink adds to infinity. But each term in the natural numbers is larger than the corresponding term in the pink series. So why don't the natural numbers add to infinity as well? If this logic is fine, why is exactly the same logic here false? And it gets worse. Here are the natural numbers, and below them the infinite line of ones. Subtract each one from the corresponding term above, and we get the same series again, just shifted along one, one term. If the natural numbers add to minus the twelfth, and we take away infinity, we get a series that adds to minus the twelfth again. Effectively, what we're saying is this. And we can repeat the process again, and again, as many times as we like, subtracting infinity in the form of an infinite line of ones, and each time getting the original series with its original total of minus a twelfth. However many times you take away infinity, the total stays the same. The sum of the natural numbers seems to be the gift that keeps on giving. I wish my bank balance were like that. This might all be reasonable if the natural numbers had an infinite sum, but not if the sum is minus a twelfth. Something's not right here. However, some of the most prominent mathematicians in history have believed it, including Leonard Euler and Srinivasa Ramanujan, both towering geniuses. Me? I'm certainly not anyone special, but then neither was the little boy who pointed out that the emperor had no clothes on. So there you are. My thoughts as an ordinary person about a rather bizarre mathematical conclusion. It only remains for me to suggest that you tell me in the comments below why I'm wrong, and for you to subscribe and click on the like button. And now for a part of the video which I hope will become a regular feature, where I give a shout out to small channels 
that I have found interesting or influential. The first one is this guy. This is Nick Nimmin, who produces, amongst other things, videos about how to improve one's YouTube channel and increase views and subscriber numbers. Now, to be fair, I am not yet in a position to follow all his advice, but I hope that that will change. And when it does, I intend to conquer YouTube, and Nick will be the man to thank. For that reason, Nick Nimmin is the first photograph on Richard's wall of cool doodiness. Thank you, Nick. Details about his channel in the description below. In fact, I have written a song about him, which I would like to perform for you now. <coughs> oh.